So I've always wanted to do this, and not always, just as of about eight seconds ago, I've wanted to do this. Um, John Manswitch, can you bring my pulpit up to the stage? Um, I just want, uh, and you got the outfit and the vest, and I'm so excited. Hey, we are, we are nothing okay. if not, that's okay, yes, a little, little to the right. That's okay, don't worry about it. Oh, how is everyone tonight? Um, you know, I love Oregon. Uh, I was, um, I, I hadn't really thought about this, um, but uh, I was, uh, I was in, uh, I was with the Zumwalt's just a few weeks ago, and uh, we were talking about this, and I, I was, uh, actually, I lived in Oregon uh, when I was two years old to, I think, five or six years old. And, uh, but uh, I must have been six. So, because uh, when I was six, and I, I remember it, it was, it was very special for me. Um, I was uh, baptized in Oregon. And so I told, I, told, uh, I told John, I said, maybe that makes me like an honorary Oregonian. Is that what it is? Oregon, or, 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 Oregon, Oregonite? Something like that, right? Something like that. Um, uh, Oregonian, uh, but that's all right. It is beautiful here. It is an honor to be able to speak tonight. Usually, I uh, usually I, I I sing, and so to speak is is a lot of fun. And uh, can you just thank our worship team real fast for for what they did and the worship leaders? Uh, well, just in case we haven't met, my name is Josh. And uh, I'm the executive pastor at Grace Woodlands. Uh, I work for um, Pastor Steve Riggle. So I appreciate your prayers. <laughs> you know, uh, working for Pastor Steve is, uh, um, is an interesting journey, um, mainly because of this reason. So uh, every once in a while, I don't know if you get this, I, it may just be me getting old, but I, when the weather changes, and the barometric pressure adjusts, um, I get headaches. And so I'll you know, just you know, pop some ibuprofen or whatever, and, and it's just a thing. So you know, every once in a while, uh, the weather changes in Texas. Uh, and uh, every once in a while. And so I'll, you know, I'll be like, oh man, I have a really bad headache. And so when I first moved to Texas eight years ago from Salt Lake City, Utah, where uh, me and my family, uh, we had uh, planted a church there in 2007. And then 2008, we joined Grace International. Uh, we, uh, we moved to Texas and noticed this thing and I, I would, uh, I would be in a meeting with him and, and I'd be like, oh man, my head really hurts today. And just kind of, you know, under my breath, I didn't want to make a big deal about it. You know, I'm a hard worker. I, I think I like to think I have good work, work ethic and I'm going to, you know, just push through. So I'd be like, oh man, I, you know, bad headache. And, and until I realized till, you know, he, he used this story in some sermons, uh, and I realized the fullness of, well, the scope, I should say, of what had happened in the Philippines, and I realized that this whole time I've been like, oh yeah, you know, it's a hard day today, I, I have a headache, and he was probably thinking in his mind, oh yeah, one time I was knifed and my wife was shot, and that was a hard day too, Josh, so <laughs> get back to work. <laughs> but it's a, it, is, it has been an honor and a privilege to work for Pastor Steve and Becky, and uh, uh, they appreciate your prayers. Um, Becky had knee surgery, and it's, uh, it's all going well, it's just in that recovery phase, and so they're, they're sorry they can't be here uh, to greet all of you. If there's one thing that I absolutely love about um, our president is that he, uh, um, let me say it like this, I love that he loves you. And I hope, I hope you really know that. I hope that you know that um, sincerely, I mean, Grace International is very big and you know, pe people all over the world, but um, he cares about you and he thinks about you. And that trickles down to our staff, our Grace Woodland staff. If you've been to the annual conference, 
uh, that we have every, uh, now every spring. Um, you know that our team works very hard. I'm very proud of them to be the best hosts we can be uh, for that conference. I invite all of you to be there and uh, put it on your calendar and, and uh, save up for it if you need to join us uh, in the Woodlands. But, but we love serving Grace International. We love serving you. We love praying for you. We love cheering you on. We love uh, anytime we can be of help for you. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we love to do. And so um, I, I wanted to honor Pastor Stephen Becky, um, but I, uh, you know, I, I do that. But I also want to honor you because I think that's what he would do. And, uh, and I think that that's, uh, I've learned from him uh, in so many ways about uh, how to uh, be a leader. And so uh, I want to honor you. So real fast, just give yourselves a great hand of, uh, of just uh, happy praise tonight. Well, uh, how many were blessed this afternoon? Yeah. Phenomenal, huh? Thank you, uh, uh, Ron, Howard. Uh, you guys are absolutely brilliant, and, uh, and thank you so much, sincerely. Those are great, uh, great messages for us to hear. And... Um, uh, I love our global family. We get to hear from so many people and we get to see so many people. And uh, I've, I've had the privilege now of being in several parts of the world with our international family. Uh, but I want to uh, really quickly, just in case, uh, you know, we're not Facebook friends or something, or, or better yet, if, we're not, if you're not Facebook friends or Instagram, you know, whatever, with my wife, Brooke. Um, by the way, just uh, give her a hand. She's, uh, she's, she's down here. Uh, I, I want to uh, introduce um, my family real fast. So there's, there's Brooke, and, uh, and do you have those pictures back there? So uh, the first one there, that is Landon. He is 13 and like eight feet tall. Uh, no, he, he's like 5'10", 5'11", and uh, he just turned 13. Um, and uh, he doesn't like any sports whatsoever. Uh, he is a musician, he has perfect pitch, um, and uh, probably could have been a football player, but, uh, but I'm very proud of him. He's, uh, he's an amazing kid and a great worship leader in the youth group, and he's, he's just uh, incredible. And then uh, our, our second kid, that's Nate. We call him Nate Dog, and uh, he's, uh, he's such a great kid. He's one of the more lovable kids you'll ever meet in your life, and, uh, and he loves to just give hugs, and he just has this sweet personality. Um, until, uh, until you try to get him to eat vegetables. And then it turns really bad. Uh, but uh, that's Nate Dog. And then uh, finally, that is Summer Joy. And, uh, and you have, a lot of you at least, have met Summer the last two years. We have uh, traveled with her to all of the regionals, uh, all the regional conferences with Grace International. So she's been here uh, twice, and uh, thank the Lord, she's at home. <laughs> she's with the babysitter, and uh, we got to fly on an airplane without a two-year-old or a baby. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So those are, those are our kids, and, uh, and we absolutely love them. And so uh, we love, I love them, our global family, and I'm just honored to be here. Why don't you open up your Bibles uh, to the book of Habakkuk? Yeah, some of you, I, that always, every time I've preached on this, I hear murmurs through the audience like, oh, man. Um, I, I'll give you a hint. It's uh, page 1094 in my Bible. Um, and, uh, and then if you're still not sure, it's between Nahum and Zephaniah, <laughs> if that helps you. Um, while you're turning there, uh, the book of Habakkuk is a very unique book because he is a very unique prophet. Not a lot is known about Habakkuk. He lived somewhere in the 600s, maybe somewhere, give or take 630 BC. Um, he's not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. But he is quoted three times in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Um, he is a prophet of questions. He is a prophet of questions. Everyone say questions. questions. And that's different from most prophets because he's not a prophet speaking to the people on behalf of God. He is speaking to God sort of on behalf of the people, but really on behalf of himself. Uh, this is a special account in scripture 
This is not just a prayer, not just a song, not a psalm, not a writing, but this is a dialogue. If you're taking notes tonight, is a dialogue between a man and his God. A dialogue between a man and his God. Over the next uh, little bit, we're going to read this short book quickly, and there's only three chapters. We see this journey that really any believer who's lived on this earth for any significant amount of time will go through this journey from uh, confusion to confidence, from uh, fear, frustration, to faith, from questioning God to trusting in God. Now, I know this is a room full of pastors and church leaders, and all of you are absolutely exempt from moments of uncertainty, questioning, wondering, confusion, fear, doubt. I know that you never face anything like that. Um, so, a little, little bit about my story. I was, uh, I was born into a pastor's home. Um, it's a pretty unique situation. Uh, this, uh, this pastor went to Central Bible College to interview a bunch of young guys. He interviewed a bunch of people to be his associate pastor. The last guy he interviewed, who was actually late to the interview, uh, was my dad. And so my dad's late to this interview as a college student, um, but I guess he did enough to impress uh, this gentleman who was hiring. And uh, he, he got hired, and my, my parents, they got married, and they moved to a small church in a small town in Wisconsin to pastor with uh, this couple. And so you fast forward, and the couple, the pastor that was hiring uh, was Arnie Jacobson. And uh, he is now my father-in-law. And so I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure I'm in an arranged marriage. <laughs> One day I'm gonna find, I'm gonna find paperwork and it's just, you know, goats were exchanged, something. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Uh, but uh, yeah, they pastored together for a lot of years, and uh, which means, uh, and Salem, Oregon was one of the churches, uh, that uh, People's Church in Salem, Oregon. He was the pastor. My dad was a worship pastor and did some other things. And uh, they pastored together for almost 20 years, off and on in different places. And uh, which meant... Uh, Brooke Jacobson and I grew up together. In fact, like in the church nursery, uh, when, when we were very, you know, babies, because uh, we're only, you know, nine, eight, nine months apart, uh, which by the way, tomorrow is her birthday. What's better is I didn't forget <laughs> to say that, um, but we... Uh, uh, we grew up together and we're, you know, we were in the nursery and babies and we shared a crib, they told us. And I don't remember it, but we did. And uh, we shared a crib then and now we share a crib. Uh, and so, uh, it's, yeah, it's been a, been a wild ride. I've known, I've known Brooke all my life and, uh, and that's pretty great. But we, uh, we, I grew up in a pastor's home and I, it was ministry and my my mom is very talented and has a great voice. My dad's an amazing worship leader and he, he was an incredible counselor and shepherd of people and a, a good teacher um, in his own right and uh, loves people. And I, I mean, if you grew up in ministry, you know how I grew up, I know how you grow, grew up. It's difficult, isn't it? It's incredibly rewarding and if you're called to it, you can't do anything else. You, can, you, can't, you, you can try to run from it, but it follows you right? And so, so when, when you're in ministry, you deal with all kinds of stuff. You deal uh, with grief and loss and heartache and drama and issues and situations. Um, and none of that is actually yours. It's other people's issues. But you are along for the ride because that's what you're called to do. You're called to be along for the ride with people. We've all heard the joke, ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. <laughs> but that's not what we're called to. We're not called, we're not called 
to make sure the auditorium is vacuumed, although it should be. We're not called to make sure the window's clean. We're not called to make sure the bills are paid. We're not called to repaint the walls every 10 years. We're not called to to hire staff and to manage. We should do all those things and we should do them excellently and as uh, unto the Lord and with great stewardship and, and, uh, and, and we, we should serve the Lord in all of those areas. But at the end of the day, we're called to people. But that comes with a lot of stuff, doesn't it? And you deal with the people side, then you deal with all the, you know, just when you think everything's good, the roof leaks. And you deal with how are we going to pay these bills? How are we going to build that extension on the kids' area? How are we going to get this taken care of or expand this? Or what do we do with this person? How do we hire this? How, how do we pray in a volunteer for this? And then, and then you have the weight of your community, don't you? Kids are going to schools in your community that school boards are making incredibly, um, well, some, some school boards are just making absurd decisions based on what goes in libraries, what teachers are, are and aren't allowed to do. And our people, our church, our congregation looks to the pastor a lot of times and says, what are we supposed to do? And hopefully, this isn't what this message is about, but hopefully you are standing up, you are speaking out for godly moral values in your community, you are being a prophetic voice, and, uh, and, and do whatever you can to, uh, to impact those school boards. Can I get an amen? amen. We got to. That's, what, that's, that's how we're called to lead, especially in this day. But he, so here's the thing, with all of this, we're not, we're not robots. Last time I checked, I'm not being controlled by AI. So we feel all of it. And the weight of leadership is heavy. It impacts us sometimes even more than we realize. It impacts how we make decisions and how, and how you know, how we lead how we love, how we speak to our families, the time that we spend with them. If you're in ministry, you know that all of that doesn't, well, it's not like you just leave it in the office and, and punch out and go home, do you? Again, you can try, but it follows you. And so we face these issues, these these situations and it's, it has a weight to it. And then we look at what's happening in our nation and we are called to the pulpit, yet so many pulpits are silent. So Habakkuk finds himself in a very precarious situation He's looking around his nation and he's saying, we have a big problem. And so what other prophets, you know, we read about, did, they heard from the Lord and they went to the people and said, here's what the Lord says. He looked around and we get this, this amazing account of him going to the Lord. And this is what he says. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. <laughs> Does that sound at all familiar? 
I'll ask it one more time just because. Does that sound at all familiar? Yes. Right? So what happens when a nation is moving towards, I believe, judgment? And I try to pray almost every day that the Lord will show us mercy here in the United States of America. We don't deserve it. But I, I pray that he will show his face and we will see revival in our land. Because that's what it's going to take. Habakkuk knew this too. So he goes to God. How long, O Lord? And what unfolds through this chapter, and we're going to move through it quickly, is this dramatic dialogue that moves in phases. It's like and if, you, if you read it slowly and you read it a few times, you start to get this scene in your head, this movie in your mind of this devoted servant of God looking around at his nation. He also looks up to the Lord and he knows the character of God. But what we find is that he really struggles to recognize and, 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 and understand the ways of God. Maybe you haven't been there, but I have. Where you just don't quite understand. So Habakkuk, he, he uh, asks questions of the Lord and the Lord replies. And so we find Habakkuk, number one, he's in the questioning phase. How long, O Lord? Why don't you do something? Why don't you do something? And he asks very bold and honest questions. And the Bible study part is, it's okay to ask God questions. It's okay to ask him bold questions. Habakkuk is saying, look, if God, I, I'm pretty sure you're great. I'm pretty sure you're big. Why don't you fix this? Why don't you take care of it? How long are you going to leave us hanging? I'll tell you this. God is not offended in Scripture by people's questions. You are not, and, and you are not less spiritual if you ask questions. Because I'll tell you what, God is so big and so great, he can take your questions. He can take your questions. One of our presidential candidates can't seem to take any questions. And that's in my notes. That's how much I wanted to say that. That wasn't like, oh man, I just let it fly. No, 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 I planned to say that one. <laughs> but God can take your questions. In fact, I think God even invites them. Because when I know, when I ask God deep, sincere, honest questions, it doesn't bring me farther away from him. It brings me closer to him. It brings me more into a more intimate conversation with him when I open my heart and say, God, why? And because he can take it, I think he invites our questions to draw us deeper into his presence. We live in this time where wickedness surrounds us and we ask these questions and, and Habakkuk stood in this tension between this frustration and yet he has faith in the Lord and so... I, yeah, I find it interesting that even though God answered Habakkuk, did you know that uh, God, God doesn't have to answer? Be assured that when he does, his answers are perfect, but he doesn't have to answer. I, I heard several pastors say this, uh, and I thought it was great. I, I, think, I think this is true. Sometimes God may be silent out of his mercy for us. In other words, the questions we ask are never too heavy for him, but the answers he may give may be too heavy for us. And I think a lot of people are programmed to believe that silence equals absence. In my house, with little summer joy, silence means problems. 
the other day, it was silent. And I thought, and I was working, and she was running around, and then I just hadn't heard from her for a while. So I said, Summer, nothing. Summer Joy, nothing. Summer, and she flies around the corner. I thought, oh, she was just in the kitchen. And then she got a little closer, and I started to smell something. And she smelled horribly like garlic. And she had dumped garlic powder, a big thing of garlic powder, all over her, all over the kitchen. She smelled like garlic for four days, you know. <laughs> oh, you guys cooking breadsticks? No, just our, our daughter's here. Just because God may be silent doesn't mean he's not there. He has not left you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou art with me. Thou art with me. Sometimes you may even find yourself needing to say that to yourself. Oh, thou art with me. You are with me, Lord. You're with me. There have been times like you I've really wanted the answer, though. Just quick poll, who's ever been in a season where they really wanted answers? About 50% of you. The other 50%, why would God allow this? Why do I have to go through this? I don't deserve this. Why, why would I have to face this? Sometimes it can get real personal too. Why does my child have to deal with that? Why did that have to affect my marriage? Why does that have to happen in my church? There's a church down the road it should have happened at, at, but not mine. Why did that person have to die? Why don't I have what they have? Why don't I get that opportunity like he did? When we lose a loved one, why God? Why now? I was talking with Pastor Steve on the phone and my dad now, amazing pastor, incredibly talented, very smart. He has now been in assisted living for almost six years because that's the only place that he can be safe. I'm pretty sure if we wouldn't have put him there, he would be with the Lord. He has epilepsy and so he, he has seizures and falls a lot. So right now, he has a cast on one wrist and arm because he fell and broke his arm. Uh, and then he got a pink cast because uh, uh, one of his, his granddaughters wanted him to have a pink cast. So he got a pink cast. And then the other one, he just uh, fell the other week and broke his uh, collarbone. And so he has this in a cast and this in a sling. And so he's just walking around like this. And, and I, talked, I told Pastor Steve that. And his response was, oh my goodness, why? <laughs> Literally, he said, Why? That stuff we just don't have answers for, do we? He's 65. We go through those things and we want answers and while answers um, may provide a little clarity, um, they don't always bring the peace, do they? Because what we want isn't always what we need. And God knows the difference between the two. We should be grateful that we don't just simply serve a God that gives us what we want. We actually serve a great God that provides what we need. In the moment, we want it. But looking over a lifetime, thank you, Lord, you provide what we need. We want answers, but we need peace. We want clarity, but we need healing. We want to know why, but really we need, we need restoration. And true peace and true healing and true restoration won't be found in the absence of trials and it won't be found in the answers to everything we go to. All of those things ultimately are simply found in the presence of God. Come to me all you who are weary and I will give you rest. Not answers. 
Not to say that God doesn't give answers. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he knows that's what you need. But often I've found in my life and in so many lives of others, the answers don't come as clear as we would want them to come. So where does that leave us? Because like Habakkuk, he's in this questioning phase. And Josh, I thought that the questioning phase was okay because God can, God can take it. Uh, but there's, there's one more piece of this questioning phase that you need to know. God can take your questions. It's okay to be in the questioning phase. But there is an enemy of your soul that desperately wants you to stay there. Because he knows if he can keep you in the questioning phase, you'll never actually move forward. You'll always be looking back. So while God is okay with you looking back for a time, eventually he wants your eyes forward. Better yet, he wants your eyes up. I will lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, not from crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's of the tragedy I went through, but simply knowing that how I get through that tragedy and I actually move forward is spending time in the presence of the Lord and being open to allow God to provide what I need in my soul. So we're in the questioning phase and we decide to move forward. So what's next? After God's response, which was wild, because God says, by the way, I love verse five, one five, it says, and this is often quoted, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am about to do something you wouldn't even believe if you were told. And when you read that, you're like, yes, yeah. And then you read the next verse. So pastors, it's just a good lesson, especially young pastors, always read the next verse. <laughs> For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. They were, the, they were worse. The kingdom of Judah wasn't good, but they were worse. He's going to raise them up. And then he, he describes them. It's, they're, they're terrible and dreadful, it says in verse 7. Nine, they, they all come for violence. And he describes, I'm raising them up as judgment for, for your kingdom, for turning your back on me. That's a paraphrase. One little note about answers. You know, I wonder if Habakkuk was sitting there kind of going, oh man, be careful what you wish for because God's answers may not be the answer you were looking for. So he comes with a second question. You can read that in verse 12. But are you not everlasting, O Lord my God? My holy one? He's, I think he was trying to remind God, hey, remember who you are. Have you ever tried to remind God who he is? I think he can actually take that too. But you're like, hey, remember God, you're, you are all powerful. You can do it. And then it says, oh Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. You have marked them for correction. You're, you are of pure eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? He says, why are you raising them up? And then in, in chapter two, Habakkuk decides to move out of the questioning phase. The question marks all of a sudden kind of go away. Question, 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 question. Chapter two. What does he say? I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So that's the second phase. Let's move forward out of the questioning phase and let's go into the watching and waiting phase. The watching and waiting phase. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. 
Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Isaiah would say, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Psalm 27 says, wait on the Lord, be be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Lamentations even says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Isaiah Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So in this watching and waiting time, we see right after that, God answers again. Again, this is the dialogue between a man and his God. God answers. By the way, will God answer you like he answered Habakkuk? I don't know. I've asked God questions and I haven't, I haven't received answers as clear as Habakkuk did, but I can't prove this is how it works, but this is the way my brain works. I'm not sure if I'll get the answers if I never ask the questions. That's a thought. If I never go to God, if I just think I can do it on my own, or I don't bother to open my heart to him. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. I'm so thankful that God doesn't just work uh, in one lane. He works in multiple lanes, doesn't he? He works in multiple lanes around us. He's working over here. He's working in Oregon. He's working in Washington. He's working in California. He's working in Texas. He's working in South Africa. He doesn't just work in multiple lanes around us, but he's working in multiple lanes in us. Think about that. He's working in multiple lanes in us, which means that during a watching and waiting time where we're waiting on the Lord, I wonder what amazing things he might be doing in us. We have this ministry out of our church called uh, the Grace Garage, and it's a garage uh, that is a pretty incredible four-bay garage that was paid for by a family in our church, and um, he has some car dealerships, and then he he was selling one of his dealerships at the time, and so he not only paid for the build, but he also put in these lifts and this alignment machine and gave us a bunch of equipment, trained us on how to use it. It was just an amazing gift, and out of that, we've been able to uh, work on uh, many cars. We'll work on anywhere from eight to 15 cars a month uh, with all volunteer mechanics, and this is like real work. Some of it's quick, but it's it's, uh, significant, Uh, thousands of dollars a month. Uh, that we provide uh, to these single moms, widows, and wives of deployed military. Single moms, widows, and wives of deployed military, right? That's amazing. Praise the Lord. And so we bring in their car, we work on it, do all this. Well, the girl who runs it, her name's Megan. She's new on our staff. She just started in March. Um, She knows absolutely nothing about cars. (laughs) Nothing. She's like 28 and... I, you know, I can't even verify she knows how to drive a car, <laughs> much less know how to fix a car. Josh, why would you put a girl who has no knowledge about cars? She's running the Grace Garage successfully. Why would you do that, Josh? Well, her and her husband want to plant a church, a Grace International church, by the way, in the coming years. So what I want her to learn, I want her to learn how to airlift a ministry, an outreach ministry at that, and work out all the systems, manage the budget, work on the volunteers, and she knows how to lead worship. She's good at that. She's been doing that since she was a teenager. But but this is out of her comfort zone, and it's out of her talent scope, and she has to actually make it happen. Learn, not how to fix the cars, but how to lead the people. And so if I can use the garage 
to have Megan be a better pastor and leader in the future, how much more do you think God can do in you during a waiting period? So we're in this watching and waiting period. God won't just fix your circumstance sometimes. He'll use the waiting to equip you for your calling. This happens at any stage and any age, by the way. So, we see an amazing verse we're going to come back to. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. In verse 3. So, then this moves to the third phase. The praying phase. The praying phase. We see through chapter 2 that it's the woe to the wicked. Basically, summary is, God is assuring Habakkuk, look, I've got it, I'm just going to do it on my terms. So sometimes the Lord says, look, pastor, I got it. I'm just going to do it in my timing and on my terms. And we get to go, all right, all right, Lord. So we see in in chapter three, this last chapter of the book, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shiganoth. By the way, you know how many Christians, how many even pastors, unfortunately, church leaders, either don't get to this phase very quickly, or they may never get there in some areas. Because they're gonna go into the watching and waiting phase and they may just wait. I'm just waiting on the Lord to do something. Have you prayed about it? A little bit. Oh, our church is just waiting on the Lord. Do they pray about it? Not really. Hopefully. Do you gather as a church to pray? A couple times a year. Do you have weekly prayer meetings? No. Do you pray in your church? A little bit. Do your people pray? Hope so. And then you might slide into the praying phase for a second, and then you go back to the watching and waiting, and then if the enemy has his way, he'll move you back to the questioning phase. And you're going, why is this happening, Lord? And he might be saying, because you haven't prayed. Maybe. Maybe. So, have a prayer meeting is what I'm saying. Uh, Habakkuk 3.1 a prayer on, of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shiganoth. Shiganoth, we're not sure exactly what that is. It's, it, it could be like an instrument or specific song instructions, but we're pretty sure it means to be playing or singing with strong emotion. I want to go back to, uh, to that verse that I talked about. Because... It's important in our prayer time to understand something. And James, you can come on up. Chapter 2, verse 3, says, Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Turn to someone and say, it will not tarry. Okay, sounds good. But it just said, though it tarries. Though it tarries, it will not tarry. This is my favorite part in this, actually, this whole message, honestly. Because I've been here. I'm like, yeah. all right, what does that mean? Though it tarries, it will not tarry. Do you think it was a mistake? Do you think it was a slip of the pen? Do you think my translation got it wrong? Though it tarries, Wait for it, because it surely come. It will not tarry. I don't think it's a mistake. In fact, I know it's not a mistake. Here's why. To us, things may appear to tarry. That means to delay. It may feel like it's taking too long, like it's never going to happen, like God's not going to do it. And all those questions we've been asking and all of that, we're just not, we're just not sure. And 
I get it, those, though it tarries, wait for it. So we're in this waiting phase and we want to, we want to move to a praying phase, but then we're sucked back into this waiting phase and we, we, we go to God and we don't get the answers uh, that we're looking for. And, and then we remember this verse, though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Uh, here's the deal. When you're waiting and when you're praying, don't get impatient. Because though it delays, it's actually not delayed. Because what is God's timing if it isn't perfect? So you may think it's tarrying, but it does not tarry. Because there is an appointed time that God is going to bring something to resolve your situation. Now, here's the tough part. It may be tomorrow, or it could be when Jesus comes. And he makes all things new, and we go into eternity with him. But at some point, the Lord shows himself faithful, but it not, may not be on our timing. But what I can promise you is this, though it tarries for us, it does not tarry because he has a kairos time, an appointed time for everything, and it will be exactly when it needs to happen, how it needs to happen. In Hebrews, it says, he who is coming, meaning he's not here yet, is coming, he's coming. He who is coming will come and will not tarry. He's not here yet, but he's not going to be late. It's not solved yet, but it's not going to be late. You haven't seen the breakthrough yet, but it, it's not going to be late in the grand scheme of what God has and the story he is writing for all of humanity. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will not tarry. So, one thing that I find myself praying for, and I feel like it tarries, but then God shows me something that just reminds me that he is still here, he is still working. We desperately need a revival in our churches and in our pulpits and a revival in the United States of America. Chapter three, verse two says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. Spurgeon says this, revive your work. What is God's work? Why, it's God's people. We are his workmanship. True revival must first come upon the churches themselves. In all churches, there is much work that is not God's work, and we do not have to have it revived, but rather that it may be put away. But wherever there is anything that is God's work, any mind of Christ, any sincere prayer, any faith, any hope, any love, any consecration, we earnestly cry, O oh Lord, revive your work. Living saints alone are in the exact sense of the word, capable of revival. We can only revive those in whom life is already found. Remember, because revival is for the believer. You can't revive something that's never been vived. I think that then it's just vival. It's not revival, right? Something like that. Revival is for the believer. The revival is for the church. And revival is... It always starts with prayer and a people asking God for mercy and repenting. 
Always. You hear about the baptisms. You hear about the crowds. You hear about the, the you know, overflowing rooms and, and people all the way down the block and around, you know, whatever, whatever. But, you know, you don't hear until later about the small group of people that started praying and seeking the Lord and asking him for mercy and repenting of our sins and asking him to show his face once again. So, Spurgeon just says, O oh Lord, quicken your people, for we need revival to save us from the perils of the midst of the years. We need to have life anew imparted to us. Revival in the believer, revival in the pastor, revival in the church is where we need to start. And then, coming to the end of this message and the story of Habakkuk. He moves from the praying phase to the praising phase. His glory covered the heavens, it says, in verse three. His earth was full of praise. Brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand. There was power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and a fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. The everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. That chapter continues to praise God for his power, for his majesty, for his dominion over the earth. And praise is happening prior to victory. Has Habakkuk got the victory yet? No. Which, side note, don't wait for victory to praise. Praise him in the middle. Praise him in the middle of it. Praise him prior to what you hope to see. And actually, did God answer Habakkuk? Yes, he did. Was it the answer Habakkuk was looking for? No, it was not. Did God rescue that kingdom from judgment from the Babylonians? No, he did not. So where does that leave him? He, 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 he questions. And then he waits. And then he prays. And then he praises the Lord because God is worthy of our praise. And he was speaking truth and glorifying God. And then... Where does it leave him? Well, the last phase that you get to enter into in a situation or a problem or a season or a, or a difficulty you're facing or in a season uh, or in a, a situation like we have in America right now or a problem in your community or an issue in your church, you get to go through all these things and we see Habakkuk almost as a template because when we don't get the answers we're looking for or you don't have, have you know, uh, an understanding of what to do next, just keep moving through this because at the very end, at the very end of the story, Habakkuk's terminology has changed. You can even read it in the words, his attitude is different, his spirit is different. After all of that, what God has done in him through this book is incredible, yet the nation is still doing everything that it is doing in the first six verses. So he moves into this last phase, the trusting phase. In one of my favorite passages of all scripture, in chapter three, verse 17, it says this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, say yet, yet, yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yes. The, the trusting phase. Let me show you one more thing. I wonder...
Psalm 13, six very short verses, says this. How long, O Lord, there's that question again. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted above me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? But, yet, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. The trusting phase. The last verse of Habakkuk says this. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. He will make me walk on my high hills. He will make me walk on my high hills. He will make me walk on my high hills. My high hills. Do you have any high hills? Precarious situations? Difficulties tonight? Things you're facing and you're dealing with it the best you know how, but they're high hills. He will make your feet like deer's feet. Like deer's feet. What does that mean? Have you ever seen a deer on high hills? Actually, yeah. Some of you maybe even have been to Israel and seen a certain, certain animal called the Nubian ibex. The Nubian ibex. And I want to give you a picture before I'm done and then we're going to end tonight with some prayer. If you're facing your high hills tonight, and you want to exist in the trusting phase, I want you to see the picture that could have very well been a close picture to when Habakkuk was writing this. He will make my feet like deer's feet. The Nubian ibex is a special, special animal. And I want you to take a look at what the Nubian ibex can do and how God created this. Red foxes lie in wait. At the first sign of danger, the young Ibex instinctively run back to steeper ground. But heading for this particular rocky outcrop could be a mistake. It's a 30-foot drop. The fox has them trapped, or so it seems. Is what Ibex were born to do.
And it certainly can't follow them up here. All it can do is wait for one to slip and fall. Youngsters are fast learners, and they're now almost as sure-footed as their parents. will have to find its meal elsewhere. Now, at last, the young Ibex can drink. The Lord God is your strength. Hear me tonight. The Lord God is your strength. In whatever phase you find yourself, maybe you're at the very beginning and you are stuck in that questioning phase. You are having difficulty figuring out how to get to the, through the waiting and get to the praising and you get to the praising and then something else hits you and then it's a whole thing and you're going through it. Know that the Lord God is your strength. He is your husband's strength. He is your wife's strength. He is your family's strength. He is your church's strength. And he will make your feet like deer's feet. When the wolf is chasing you, when every time you look back and you go, oh my goodness, how will this wolf please just give up? He will make your feet like deer's feet. And there'll be moments where you slip and you fall. But the Lord God is your strength. He will make your feet like deer's feet. And he will make you walk on your high hills. So whatever you may be facing tonight, whatever you may be going through, we all probably have something. But I know sometimes it gets really difficult. And it could have been something that happened yesterday or it could have been something that happened 20 years ago. But know that you can trust in the Lord. Yet, yet, I will trust. Yet, I will rejoice. And I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. So God, we thank you. You are our strength. You make our feet like deer's feet and you make us walk on high hills. Though the fig tree may not blossom nor the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will joy in the God of our salvation. For the Lord God is our strength. We thank you, God, and we love you. Praise the Lord.